whoever it was who was that I heard that, you know, the devil, God, God's not got no problem with the devil. The devil doesn't pose a threat to God at all. God's not worried about him at the least. But for reasons I don't know, angels and people are engaged in a battle. He lets us engage those forces which, although they're not seen to the naked eye, they're very, very real. And they attack you. And you're either going to be one of two things. You're either going to be a soldier and stand against them and fight, or you're going to be a captive to them. One of the two. You're, there's no in-betweens. There's no neutral ground. You're either for Christ, and if you are, then you're a soldier. You're going to engage these forces, and the Bible tells that so. They're in uh, chapter 6, and he tells us what to do. As Christians, these are instructions to us, and he tells us to put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the devil. You know, that's uh, very plain instructions there. And then he tells us what we're up against. Doesn't explain everything, but it's stated. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There just seems to me by reading that, that there is sort of a chain of command in the kingdom of darkness. There's those that are up higher than other. Principality means a prince or a ruler over an area. And uh, so he seems to have it organized to some extent. And there's a concentrated effort to overthrow God, overthrow you, overthrow everything that God wants. And uh, we're going to run into that. I think Brother Tom, I, I listened to his message from last week, and every you, you hear it all the time. There's three enemies that we've got. We've got the world, the system that puts pressures on us and everything. We've got our flesh to deal with. And then we have the devil. He comes and he uses, he capitalizes on these other two things at times. But make no mistake, you will engage him. Now, most of the time, he may attack you physically through a sickness of some kind. That happens. But most of the time, even with that, the sickness, the battle is right between your ears. It's there in your mind. And so Paul gives us a list of things to put on so we can stand victorious over this. And we're not going to spend any time on them, but you know you've got the, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your loins girt with truth, feet shod with the preparation of the the, the gospel, and above all of that, a shield of faith. And he says, you'll be able to quench how many of the fiery darts? All of them. Every one. That's why the devil will attack your faith. That's why Jesus told Peter, said, Satan desires to sift you, but I prayed for you that your faith does not fail you. That's the area he attacks. If you can get a shield down, well, he can, he's wide open to, to the other areas. Then he goes on and tells us these are our defensive weapons, but then he tells us the offensive weapon we have, and that's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that's what Jesus used against Satan in the wilderness. He didn't say, I'm the Son of God, you better not mess with me. He said, it is written. It is written, and that's why Christians need to know their Bibles, because he will come at you in the realm of thought. And sometimes those thoughts can be very real. They can be accompanied by certain facts, by certain uh, realities. And the devil attacks at that point and see, God doesn't love you. He didn't answer your prayer. He is right there to fill your mind with every kind of a doubt, every kind of, of a accusation against God. You see, Revelation 12 calls him, the accuser of the brethren said he'd before the throne of God like he was Job. All the time pointing out everything, but we've got an advocate. We've got a lawyer that represents us in the court of heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. And he uses his blood to get us acquitted of charges. But not only does he stand before God and accuse me and you to him, but he accuses God to you. What kind of a God would that be? Do you think he loves you? There ain't none of this real well, some of it, but you know, if I was you, I'd, well, I'd just sort of enjoy life and take it with a grain of salt and go, he'll, he'll weaken you at every turn if you listen to his lies. Now, we went over those things very quickly, but here's the thing I want to zero in on. 
and and bring the the and everyone will say amen. But I've got to tell you, so I'm going to confess a couple of things here in a minute. Uh oh, is Bruce? Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to confess something terrible here in a minute. But it says the next verse there in verse 18. Let's all read that. Praying how often? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You see, when we end with the shield of faith and the sword of spirit, he's not finished yet. There's one more little final piece of instruction, and that is praying always. I, I'll tell you this, Christians, we cannot go long periods of time without praying and expect to maintain a good degree of spiritual strength. Can't do that. We can, and, and I, I've used the excuse, well, I'm so tired and I don't have time. I've done that in time past. But I had plenty of time to sit down and watch Sean Hannity on Fox News. Didn't have no problem with that, did I? Boy, Brother Tom cleaned our clock on that one last week. I watched his sermon. Yeah, I watch him when, when I get him. He don't escape me. I got, what's this critter got to say this week? And I get up there and, and look, he said, the flesh doesn't profit nothing. And he brought this point out. He said, watching Fox News don't profit nothing. He don't realize that just a week or two before I'd been convicted of that and told Lee, you're going to watch on it? No, turn the junk off. I'm going in the other room to pray. Because I was convicted, not because God was saying, I'm going to make you feel bad because you're a bad boy or a bad girl. I'm going to heap condemnation on you because you ain't been doing your job. You ain't been praying. No, that's not the what it is when we don't pray. We're robbing ourselves of something. Right. Because prayer is not just a religious exercise. Prayer is a privilege that's been given unto us to sit down and address the king of the earth and be assured that he is listening to you and that he hears you and he enjoys your company. Did Jesus not say, if any man will hear my voice, I'll come in and sit down and sup with him and he with me. We'll have some wonderful fellowship. God enjoys the fellowship of his people. You see, I, I'm going to throw a twist ball at you here. It just wasn't you that he thought about when he redeemed you. The blood was shed so that that would clear the way for him to enjoy your fellowship. All right. He enjoys that. He wants you to pray. Now, he wants you to come with your request. That is true. But at the he won't tell me, of course, I know everything about you, but I want to hear from him. He wants time, good quality time. And if you do not do that, then you know something? You are robbing yourself. Now, there's times, this is where the confession comes in. You ain't going to believe this, this great spiritual tower of bulwark of strength standing here in front of you. Yeah, I'll laugh at that one. But there's times I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like I've got it in me. I know I should bow out there with Lisa and pray with her. And I've been reading healing scriptures to her and anointing her with oil and everything. And there's times when I don't feel like it, though, that I sit down and I say, Lise, she loves to watch this minky stuff on her iPad I got for her. I almost wish I hadn't got that thing. And she's one. I don't know how many. If y'all want a minky, don't go buy one. These are good blankets. they $200 blankets. I can wrap up more of them and be sweating. And anyway, she's one, and she'll sit there, and I'll say, lay that aside. All right? And she's always very willing and ready. And I began reading Scripture. And as I began reading Scripture, all of a sudden, I've shifted gears some way. I don't know how to explain that. I'm no longer in the, I don't really feel like praying to, man, the fire's burning in me, and I, I, I can't wait. This and I go to praying, and it's not because I'm spiritual, but if you do enough of this, something kicks in, 
And before long, you'll find it hard not to pray. You'll find yourself looking for every chance. You'll find yourself walking around. Father in heaven, I don't know what. Oh, bless you. Lord, I thank you. You're good. You'll find yourself doing that. That's called praying without ceasing. Now, prayer is a vital part of your personal life, and that verse says so right there. And it aids you, and I want to show you if I can hurry up and, and quit rambling and get to it where this aids you at certain times, and it's for your benefit. Not only that, I'll throw this in here, but a church that is not a praying church, you cannot expect much. Hallelujah. Amen. Preach on, Brother Bruce. That's good. Thank you. I think I will. But it's the truth. Now, I'm not going to turn to it and read it. You want to know where it is, I'll tell you after service. You can read it when you get home because I realize I go a little over sometimes. But James had done been executed by Herod in the Scriptures, the book of Acts record. And <coughs> it pleased the people. And he saw that as a political mood. He got, if I got political points doing that and got brownie points and on their good side by killing James, I'll kill Peter. Why, Peter? Because they were pillars in the church. They were leaders. Smite the shepherd, sheep flee. So he locked up Peter with the intention of killing him after the Passover or holiday, whatever it was there. Now, you and I may see it as a small thing, but back in this day, do you know how much good it would have done for them to got signs and got out in the street and said, we're protesting, Peter's killed. They'd have got them killed. They just walked out and killed you. You could have hollered, well, we have rights and this is a dictator. They'd say, you're absolutely right. We're going to kill you now. Your life meant nothing. Human life was cheap to those people. There were no courts to appeal to. There were no supreme courts in the land. There was nothing. He was there, he was bound, he was under the guard of soldiers, incidentally, Roman soldiers, which was the greatest military might in the world at that time. They had nothing to appeal to, but maybe they thought like we do. Well, I don't know what to do for you, Peter. I, I guess the only thing I know to do is pray. Oh, is that all? Well, you know, when you ain't got nothing to do and all you want to do is pray for me, please, I want all of you to pray for me. Pray for me. What do you want us to pray? Whatever the Holy Ghost brings to mind, pray that for me. Now, what happened was the church realized they had one course of action to take. And what was that? They laid everything else aside that burdened them down. They placed everything on the back burner and they gathered for a time of prayer, and it wasn't for 15 minutes. Well, you guys, we prayed. Shut the lights out and go. No, no. We're going to set. we got to get Peter out. And they laid hold of the horns of the altar, and they stayed there, and they prayed to God. until. And, and it's not that God said, talk a little louder. Ain't heard you yet. Come on. No, it's I'm going to tell you something. And I've experienced it myself of recent times. When you go to God in sincere prayer and you're driven there and you feel that intensity and you lay your own selfish desire, which there's nothing wrong with things we need. But at the same time, all of a sudden, that takes a back seat and your heart is burdened by the Holy Ghost and you find yourself praying about things and people and stuff that He brings to mind. You know, you have now entered into a place of intercession and I promise you, when you do that, you have rattled Satan's cage. And he is going to come in that time of prayer, and he is going to resist you at every turn in the road. And that's what you're up against. Spiritual forces and things that are met in that unseen realm, and that's got to be prayed through and broken through and... Uh, uh, and the angels take the answer and all. It's, it's a long thing. I'm not going to go into it. But you see what I'm saying. Prayer is not just uh, kids coming and skipping into the presence of daddy. I, I get so sick of this bunch. I went and talked to daddy the other day. Right. Now, I guess he's your father. But if you want to look at him like, hey, pops, what you doing? That's just as irreverent, disgusting as it 
He's my father. My heavenly father. You love me. Thank you for being my father. And you know something? Prayer is not skipping into his presence and you hooing and ah hooing and dropping a few requests and vamoosing out. That's not it. Prayer, true, genuine prayer of what this is talking about is battle. It's a fight. It's a war. And ministers are not the only ones to do this. These are instructions to the church as a whole. And he says, praying always. And we're going to take this verse apart right here. I'm taking time, but please, let's go look at this. Praying always, that does not mean periodically. You need to have time. I do with Lisa. Me and her, I go out, shut it off, shut the, well, we're to shut it off. And we pray. And I pray over her. And she needs it. And uh, physically, I, she just lays around anyway. That's another. Uh, and so we pray. And then I sometimes when I'm done with her, I just continue praying, walking back into that little room. Brother Steve been in that little junk room of mine. It was an office at one time. Tried to make it that. And I get in, I'll shut the door so as not to disturb her. I ain't going to get quiet. I ain't going to be quiet in my own home. I'm going to pray. Talk to God. There's needs. There's needs in lives of people sitting here. There's needs in the church here. We need encouragement. There's needs in my life. Amen. I ain't going to shut up. This ain't no time to shut up. Offer up a little there. I've offered my prayer up and beat a path to the couch and sit there and glue into garbage and popcorn for two or three hours. It's not a time for that. The country's in danger. Forces are at work. We're being threatened. Well, God's got it under control. He does. I, you can rest in that. But this is a realm of mystery I don't understand. He, uh, what's the word? He solicits or what? That ain't it. But he uses your prayers as a way to get things done. And you become a partner with him. We're workers with him. He calls on you. Well, they don't call on me. Well, are you living that far from him that you can't hear his voice? Saying, come away, my beloved. Come away. Why, well, what's the great need? I need some time with you, my child. I want to hear your voice. I want to sit down. Tell me what's all on you. I, 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 I made a way through the blood of Christ. You have now access to the holiest of all where I dwell. You can come and talk to me. I want you to do that. Now, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What does supplication mean? This is where I had to write some stuff down. Is this all right? And don't say it to be nice to me. Is this all right? Yes. All right. Amen. Brother Steve said it was. So it is. Supplication. Does anybody know what that means? That's it, Debbie. That's it means to entreat, to ask, to make humble and earnest entreaty, or to petition. That's what that means, is go to God with your request. He wants you to, well, what do I want? God, I, I, I want you to uh, save my neighbor. I, I prayed for many, well, some request, something like that, that's not, well, God, what I'd like is I'd like that $500 deductible it's going to cost me to get my car fixed. No, lay that aside. He knows I need that. I, I've got something to, to confess to you here in just a moment. And it may not be great to you, but it was great to me when it struck my heart. Supplication is, is asking for things. Now it says, and do it in the Spirit. What does that mean, pray in the Spirit? If you will allow me, let us first go over to Jude 1 and 20. There's only one chapter in. Now, I told you how important faith was, didn't I? A shield of faith, that's important. Don't you think, and, and not only that, we're not going to turn to it, but in Hebrews 11, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. 
Now, another scripture in 2 Peter says we're to add to our faith. Hmm. God gives us the measure of faith. God saves us by faith. Now, it's up to you to fuel that fire. Now, have you got Jude and one? Praying in the Spirit. Verse 20. But you, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy... What did... Wait a second. That didn't read right. Building up yourself. God build me up. <laughs> you build it up. Building up your most holy faith. Doing what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Making supplications in the Spirit. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Do you see the connection there? Now, I have all kind. I don't know that there's a verse of Scripture in the Bible that tells me and what, exactly what this is or defines it. But I'm going to give you a couple Scriptures of, of what I see and, and things. I will tell you, first of all, what praying in the Holy Ghost is not. Praying in the Holy Ghost is not some dead formality that goes on in a lot of churches. It's not some dead prayer that's read off of a piece of paper somewhere. It's not somebody mumbling over Aunt Jane's boil that she's got on the bottom of her foot or something like that. Let me tell you something. When you pray, you have a partner. And that partner has been called because he realizes my weakness and your weakness. What is Jesus called the Holy Ghost? He called him the comforter. The Greek word, I don't know Greek, but I've read a bunch of them and all the Greek scholars say this. That word comforter comes from a Greek word called paraclete, if I'm pronouncing it right. And it means one called alongside to help you. What's he going to help me with everything? But he'll really help you in the, in the place of prayer. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, you say, I'm ready to pray. He's you. I'm right here to help you. Let's get her going. I'll start leading you. I'll start breathing holy fire on you. I'll blow my holy breath. The holy breath of God will come on you. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not boasting. But I usually wait till Lisa leaves the house. Because I carry on like a wild man and quote scripture and cry out and pray and everything when I I can't help that. The Holy Ghost will help you enter into a place. The Holy Ghost in praying in the Holy Ghost is entering into the Spirit in that that fire of prayer, him breathing inspiration on you. He becomes the very thing that bears you along and you bring your request, and that gives it force. It's more, how many has ever went to bed? Don't raise your hand because I know I'm the only one that ever done this. Oh, I forgot to pray. Oh, Lord, thank you. And, uh, you know, bless us and help everyone. Anybody ever do that? He ain't too much into that kind of Now, I ain't saying God don't hear it. But praying in the Holy Ghost is not somebody breathing a little dead prayer, in my opinion. It is the Holy Ghost enabling you, burden your heart, and you've entered into the Spirit now to where now to pray something in the name of Jesus Christ, it's a whole lot more than saying, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. When you begin to pray, and He inspires you what to pray. Lay certain things that are in right in the, the realm, the Word of God. You can see plainly where it's His will, and you begin to pray that. Those are the prayers prayed in the name of Jesus Christ. Praying in the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God comes over, and the inspiration is from Him. Now, I want to give you a couple of other things. The charismatic move, uh, for the most part, different Pentecostal organizations, taught that praying in the Spirit was praying and speaking in tongues. Now, you know, I, I'm going to put it this way. I think praying in the Spirit may include that, 
But I don't think praying in the Spirit is limited to just that. Does, does everybody, is that okay? I believe that it does. That's part of it, but it's certainly not all of it. Right. And if a person doesn't have that gift or don't do it, then I don't think that makes them any less spiritual. There have been great men of God that have prayed under a burden of prayer and sweated and trembled and never did speak in tongues that I know of. There was a man at Raymond Jackson's church over in, in Clarksville, Indiana, when I went there as a teenager. And he knew Brother Branham, hunted with him. Oh, he talked to us about him, told us different stuff and everything. I, wow, he said, I was afraid to sit down and think of something because Brother Branham would look at me. I said, he knows what I'm thinking. Brother Glenn, was, when he looked upon you, he just had the countenance of, and the kindness of Christ in his countenance. Unless he fooled me, but he seemed to be a very God-fearing man. To my knowledge, I never did hear tell that he spoke with tongues. But he would interpret what somebody else spoke. And he would stand up at times and prophesy. I went up in the prayer line one time and he stood up back there on that side and stood up and, and yay, my son, I say it. And he probably, I've still got it wrote down in, in one of my Bibles. So, you know, but anyway, what, I, what I'm saying is I don't think that praying with tongues is the only way you can pray in the Spirit. But I believe it does include that. Now, let me go. Why don't we all go over to 1 Corinthians 14 for a moment? Just to briefly touch on that particular praying in the Spirit. We're, we're looking at a few aspects. I don't think we could cover all of it, but we're looking at a few aspects of praying in the Spirit. Now, first off, I'm not going to read this whole chapter. You're saying, well, thank you. That's nice of you. But I'm going to tell you that Paul here addresses an abuse of gifts of the Spirit. He starts out by telling them that we're to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. They're in, uh, for, and then he lays heavy importance upon the gift of prophecy. Ver, verse 2 tells that he that speaks in an unknown tongue. Now this needs interpretation. Very quickly, let me address this. I know people that don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. They believe in the Holy Spirit, but not His power or His gifts. That all ended with the apostles. And so they say that the gift of tongues was the ability for the uh, apostles to carry the gospel into all the world and everything and speak in languages they did. The only problem with that is the known world at that time, there was no really any language barrier for most of it. Greek was a common language that was spoke almost everywhere for the areas that they went to and evangelized. And not only that, if they're speaking in a, in a tongue that these Corinthians, now the Corinthian church was Gentile church, they spoke Greek. Paul spoke Greek. Jesus spoke Greek. That's another lesson for another time, but I could prove that to you. Now, not only this, but they wouldn't need for if Do you all need anybody to interpret what I'm saying in another language? Get up here and say something in another language, German or something. No, because you, know, you understand English. They understood Greek. Paul didn't need no. So this was a supernatural, unknown tongue because it says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, what? Doesn't speak to men, but he speaks to God. And no man understands him. No man. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaks in mysteries. Now that ought to eliminate any doubt or any arguments like that. And I'm not here to capitalize on tongues. I just want to touch on this just a moment. As far as praying in the Spirit go. Notice he said, you're not talking to men, you're talking to God. And this whole chapter, nowhere does Paul say, you people stop that speaking with tongues, that's of the devil. Right. Nowhere. Right. What he does is he says, you're abusing that. You're all coming together and all of you stand like, and I don't mean to be mean, I don't want to be ugly, but I've been in, in charismatic churches where they all stand, let's all pray in the spirit. Every one of them, you know. And Paul said, if you do that, an unbeliever comes in, he'll think you are nuts. 
You, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, just quit speaking it. No, Paul said in order. In a matter of fact, he says over in the end of that chapter, he says, you know, covet to prophesy, as in verse 39, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Don't be telling people not to speak with tongues. But if you're going to do it here in the open assembly, then you know what? What good would it do for, you, for me to stand here and start laughing and saying a bunch of stuff? Would y'all be sitting there saying, okay. The Bible says he that speaks in a tongue, it says he edifies himself. It says that there in, in verse 4, he charges himself up. But it doesn't do you any good unless it's interpreted. Now, a prophecy is in a known tongue. It's just like tongues and prophecy, two nickels equal a dime. The prophecy is the, the, that without the other two. Those are vocal gifts. They're supernatural, inspired by the Holy Ghost. Now, not only that, but tongues is used for praying. I want to show you this. Look at verse, uh, where did I write my notes? 13, I think. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in it, look, he's saying pray, if I pray in a tongue, in an unknown tongue. So it is possible to pray in tongues. Is it not? Now, notice what he says. My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it? What am I going to do then? I will pray with the spirit. Which means, I will pray with tongues, and I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. Singing in tongues? Ladies and gentlemen, Brother Tom may throw me out after this next statement. If you don't want to hear anybody do that, don't come to my house because I do it. I want to let you know. Now, I haven't got time to go, and I, don't, I just wanted to make brief mention of this. I've already spent too much time on it, but I just want you to know this. During a time of worship and praying and shouting and somebody lets out a big flutter of tongues, doesn't require interpretation. They're not addressing the church. They're not in front of it or anything like that. They're praising God. And God giving them the utterance to do that. And I, I, I'm going to tell you up front, to me, it feels good. Well, we can't go on feelings. Well, okay, do you want to feel bad? It just... I'm spiritual. I don't feel nothing. God's sake. Paul said, now, Brother Tom does this all the time. And I've got the idea from him. Matter of fact, he was the one I told Lisa in here three or four years ago. She got me this amplified version. He's known for saying two things. And I say this jokingly, but I don't mean no disrespect. He's known for saying, let's read that in the amplified. And salvation is of the Lord. Now, I'm going to...